Hello to our viewers and welcome back for the second event of the FGI Speaker Series. My name is Aaron Brandeis and I'm the head tutor for FGI's University of Pennsylvania chapter. The format of the event is gonna be the exact same as the last one. Dr. Megerman will speak for about 20 minutes. Um, he'll tell you a little bit more about his background um, and he'll pick a topic of his choosing and speak about um, you know, things he's learned along the way in his very successful professional career, his philanthropic career um, and other ventures he's currently involved in. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna do some Q and A um, and it's gonna be a little bit more extensive this time. So please feel free to text me throughout the event, any questions you may have. And for those of you who are new to the FGI family, um, welcome. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded by Warren students. We teach high school students in urban communities about the power of investing. We bring classroom lessons to life by providing students with real money to invest. In our program, high school students come to college campuses where college volunteers teach them about the power of long-term investing. And today we are delighted to have Dr. David Magerman as part of our summer speaker series. David is a co-founder and current managing partner at Differential Ventures, a VC firm that provides early stage funding to B2B enterprise technology companies um, that have a unique advantage in data and machine learning. Previously, Dr. Magerman spent two decades at Renaissance Technologies, which is largely regarded as the most successful quantitative hedge fund of all time. And he's been there and he was with them since the early days and played a, a major leadership role in developing their estimation software. Dr. Megerman is also a restaurateur and he's opened up a number of kosher restaurants in the Philadelphia area and he's also a committed philanthropist. He holds a PhD in computer science from Stanford and two undergraduate degrees in mathematics and computer science from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Megerman, thanks so much for joining us um, and the floor is yours. Uh, happy and honored to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and I'm excited to talk to the students involved in your program. Um, when I first heard about uh, first generation investors, uh, it really resonated with me because I'm also a first generation investor in my family. I um, wanted to tell you a little bit about my background growing up in early education and talk about my time at Renaissance Technologies because I think it's most relevant to the topics you guys study. Um, and then talk a little bit about what I'm working on now, uh, but then hopefully you know, leave a lot of time to open it up for you guys to uh, ask questions. Um, I miss the fact that I can't connect with you guys by seeing everybody. So I hope that you guys will appreciate what I have to say and please think about questions um, and ask questions. I'm happy to elaborate on whatever topics you wanna to talk about. Um, so as I said, I I'm a first generation investor. Um, I grew up in uh, South Miami, uh, an area called Kendall. Um, my father was a taxi driver. My mother was a secretary and neither of them went to college. And uh, we, you know, we struggled, struggled with money. And uh, I knew growing up, I mean, my parents focused on education and really pushed me to be a good student and to learn. Um, but I knew that I wanted to do better um, than my parents did and really worked hard to um, improve my lot in life from where, where they were. And uh, you know, when I en ended up going to University of Pennsylvania, it was a real novel experience for me because my parents, like I said, didn't go to college. And I remember kind of vividly when I was a sophomore in college, my, my father passed away when I was a freshman. Um, and, and I was asking my mother some advice about um, a company. It was actually a, a, a Wharton graduate who founded a company in Philadelphia and offered uh, to offer me a job to write computer programs for the company if I drop out of college. Um, and I was asking my mom some advice at the time. And she admitted to me that I had exceeded her life experience as a 19 year old in college. And she really could no longer give me any advice on what to do with my life. And I really needed to focus on the, the mentors that I had around me at Penn, um, the pre pre professors and advisors there. Um, so I, I think it's great for you guys all that you have access to people at Penn um, and other, other uh, schools like that um, who can advise you, um, especially if, you know, you, again, you're first generation investors and maybe uh, there are some things that your parents don't have so much direct experience with. Um, as I said, the, the focus of my childhood and my early years was about education. And my parents impressed upon me that I should learn whatever I could and really focus on you know, achievement in education. And um, when I got to the end of my undergraduate education, um, I decided to go to graduate school, but I really wanted to work. I really wanted to build things. Um, and I, I was as much an engineer as I was, I and mean, I studied math, math and computer science, but I didn't really view myself as a scientist. I viewed myself as an engineer. And I focused my time in grad school in building computer systems. Um, I know for you guys now, 
computer systems are like, you know, uh, soup. You know, they're like they're 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 like on the street corner. It's like nothing special. But back when I was a kid growing up, um, I got my first computer um, when I in 1979 when I was in elementary school, and the computers really weren't a thing when I was growing up. It was like a real oddity. In fact, I was kind of ostracized. Like I was kind of a nerd. Uh, you know, still kind of a nerd, but I was definitely uh, labeled as a nerd because I liked computers at the time, and uh, computers really weren't a thing. And um, I, I still got into them and I learned about them as an undergraduate and then was studying computer science in graduate school and trying to make computers understand language and think, you know, artificial intelligence. Again, things that you guys think of all the time, you know, Tesla and self-driving cars. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with what's going on in the world with uh, uh, automating different things that people do. But back in the, in the 80s and 90s, it was a real novelty. And frankly, it wasn't really possible. Um, computers weren't fast enough, and there really wasn't enough data to do the kind of things we're doing now. You know, the internet didn't exist. Think, think about that. The internet didn't exist um, when I was working in computers uh, in the early days. So um, it really was the Wild West, or really kind of like, you know, the frontier for computer science. And I was just trying stuff out. And I really didn't have a career plan. Um, I was going to become an academic. I tried to become a professor, but uh, no one wanted me. Uh, poor me. Uh, so I ended up stumbling into this really weird job um, where these guys who worked at a quantitative hedge fund were looking for someone with my computer skills to help them with computer science. Um, it was founded by a famous mathematician um, who did some really complicated stuff I don't really understand in, uh, in computer science in, in uh, mathematical theory um, in the uh, 80s, 80s, 70s and 80s. And uh, he used his mathematical skills to build a company that studied how prices uh, changed in the markets and tried to build mathematical models to understand them. And basically he had a lot of what he wanted to do already built, but he didn't have a lot of computer science engineers to help build it. So it was, um, and at the time I joined the company, they were um, trading in some markets, they were trading in, uh, you guys know about um, bonds and currencies um, and, and stock index futures, um, but they weren't, they hadn't figured out how to trade in, in the stock markets. And part of the problem was that their software systems couldn't deal with trading thousands of stocks at the same time. They could trade, you know, individual instruments like individual bonds. They could trade dozens of, of, of uh, you know, of uh, futures contracts and bonds. Um, they could trade five or six currencies at a time, but they didn't know how to scale their systems up to trade thousands of stocks um, together. And so when I joined Renaissance, they were, um, they were trying to do stock trading and I joined the company and they were failing. Um, and I remember, I remember that the, they, the people who uh, I work with were annoyed at me and, and the people I work with because there were four or five of us working in stock trading and we were managing like 5% of the company's capital. We were responsible for like minus 10% of the company's profits because we were losing money. Um, and we were paid like everybody else. So um, people were kind of annoyed with us. They thought we were overpaid. They thought we should be paying the company because we were losing money. Um, but they had faith in us. And eventually we uh, you know, validated that faith by uh, producing a, a, a system that worked. Um, so what we did um, was akin to what, uh, what a casino does. If you think about a casino, um, let's say they have blackjack, they have a craps table, they have uh, slot machines. And they work off of the premise that all of their gaming tables have an edge. It might be 5149. It might be that, that every time someone gambles at their table, 51% of the time the house is going to make money and 49% of the time the gambler is going to make money. Some other things have 54% to 46%. But all you know, the only games that casinos will play are games where they have a statistical edge. And there's a thing called the law of large numbers which says that if on average, you're gonna make money 55% of the time, it doesn't matter if you go on a losing streak because that's just bad luck. But eventually if you, you gamble enough times and, you, and you, you bet on your strategy enough times, if you're gonna make money 55% of the time, in the long run, you're gonna make money as long as you don't go below zero. <laughs> that's kind of the, the key thing is when you're, especially when you're leveraging, when you're, when you're borrowing money to, to, to double down on your bets, you have to make sure you don't go below zero. But the law of large numbers tells a mathematician that if you, if you run your, your operation like a casino, casinos are always gonna make money. And Renaissance was a casino. 
Um, they were the house. They had mathematical models that they convinced themselves could have an edge over the rest of the market. And so if we knew that our models could make money, if we, if we bet a dollar that 55% 50 of the time we were going to make money and 45% of the time we were going to lose money, as long as we never went below zero, we could keep playing and eventually make more money. Um, and the cool thing about the stock market at the time, and eventually it got even better for us, we could get anywhere from four and a half to seven to one leverage. So we could, so we were legally allowed to borrow if we wanted to, to if we had a dollar, we could actually buy four dollars worth of stock if we wanted to. And if we would go long, and you guys know about short selling, if you borrow a stock and sell it short. So if we went long and short and had a balanced portfolio, we could actually be almost seven and a half to one lever. Um, and so, so we could basically, if we could be like five to five or six to one lever, we can get to the law of large numbers five or six times faster, which would make it even more likely that we'll make money. So we, our goal was to use computers and math and statistical modeling to, and, and, and smart people searching for, you know, new ways of predicting things. And we were going to try to build a system that we believed had as much of an edge over the rest of the market. And then we were just going to leverage to, leverage to death and, and make, it, make as many bets as we could. And in the early 90s, you know, so in the, in the mid 90s, we started doing this. And there wasn't a lot of people doing computerized trading at the time. Again, pre-internet, there was no internet. Uh, there were a few um, platforms that did stock trading um, on computers, but the vast majority of stock trading was done in person at the New York Stock Exchange. We, with our little shop, which with you know maybe a few tens of millions, maybe like a hundred to two hundred million dollars of of capital under management, were trading four or five percent of the New York Stock Exchange volume. So for every every sh for every twenty shares traded in the New York Stock Exchange, we were one of those shares. Um, so it was really kind of a heady time for us because we we're this little little group in Stony Brook University um, with a group of like a couple of programmers writing software and we were trading that much volume. Um, and at the time, I was the only one who knew how the system worked because I was the guy who wrote the, the, the software to do the trading. And I basically wasn't allowed to go on vacation because if I went on vacation and something broke, then no one could fix it. And the truth is in the early days, our systems failed. Our programs crashed probably like every two or three hours at best, sometimes you know, like five or six times a day. And I had to be there to pick up the pieces. Um, at the time we traded every 15 minutes. So when a program failed, I usually had like five or 10 minutes to figure out what went wrong, fix it and get the programs up and running so we could get back to trading. Um, so that was the early days. Obviously things got a lot more mature as we got more money under management. And eventually we were like a five or $6 billion fund um, we were trading all around the world um, using using similar models. Um, but th at the end of the day, our system worked because we had an edge over everybody else because our models predicted the markets, predicted what was going to happen well enough for us to make money like a casino. Um, and so I learned a couple of you know key lessons about stock trading uh, from this. And also from my experience watching the world develop around me and, and, and other, other funds um, trading, making money, blowing up and, and doing different things. The most important thing which I wanted to convey to you is while it's great that you guys are learning how to invest in the stock markets and you, know, you should use your, your intuition and, and you know, if you understand something about you know, uh, electric cars or about you know, movies, you know, bet with what you know. But the truth is that what I learned at Renaissance is that when we're ready to trade, information doesn't matter. Like you think we would be, we'd have, you know, hundreds of people pouring over news feeds, watching news, trying to figure out what happens, what happened in the world. The truth is that while some people do trade that way and they can make fundamental bets um, on stocks that they want to hold for a long time, we were trading in and out of stocks pretty quickly. Um, not quite high frequency trading, but we were trading out, you know, holding like we say from a, like a, a day to a week to a month. Um, but, you know, usually on the, on the, on the shorter side. And when we, the, our, generally what we looked at was not news. We just looked at price movements because we assumed that any news we could see as people, someone else had already seen that news. They'd already traded off of it. And whatever I needed to learn from that news was already encoded in some way in the prices in the stock market. 
So all of our models just looked at price and volume and you know trading volume and, and how much trading was happening on different parts of the of the spread and and you know how how deep the book was of, of, of orders that were waiting. We looked at the the actual people betting on the market and we assumed that anything that could be known about stocks, especially because we're trading you know four or five or ten thousand different stocks at a time, that we couldn't possibly figure out what was going on in the world from the news. But we knew that there were people who were experts on every single stock who were reading the news and they were trading off of it. And so if we just looked at the stock prices, we could glean what we needed to know about stocks. So it's important for you to understand if you guys are you know, thinking about doing trading on your, you know, your accounts that you guys are managing, when you see news happen, you have to assume that everyone bigger than you already knows that. So you can't assume, oh, there's just been news about Disney. I'm going to go trade because Disney's going to go up because of that news. No. Everyone who trades Disney already heard that news, you know, minutes to hours before you did. They've already traded off of it. And if they're going to buy Disney stock based on that, the stock price has already moved up to where that news reflects the price should be based on that news. So you want to be thinking not so much reacting to individual news or immediate news, but thinking long term about what it means. A lot of times people overbuy things and stock prices go up more than they should based on news. And if you could think, wow, they've overreacted to this news and tomorrow they're going to look at this and say, wow, this is really dumb. We shouldn't have bought this, this stock. We shouldn't have bought Disney. Then you can use that intuition to say, hey, I'm going to bet against Disney because it went up too much. But and that's kind of the, the kind of thing we would look for is, is people over betting and we, we call them reversionary signals. If we saw a stock going up too much, we would sell it. Um, and especially looking at it relative to its industry. Um, but basically, we learned that um, information news is not what you think it is. Eventually, we figured out that there are ways in which news can be useful. Like I said, if you see some big news happen, and then you see a stock go up a lot, the combination of that news and the stock going up might mean it's going to go down. So positive news about a stock may actually be a sign a stock's going to fall. Um, and so that's where it's, it's kind of like, that's why com using computers and math and statistical models to to bet in, in the stock markets is sometimes better because you don't, you know, human beings think a certain way and all the traders out there are human beings. For, well, these days, not as much, but, you know, there are a lot of human beings behind the trading going on and you want to be thinking ahead of them and you can't get ahead of them with information because they're going to beat you to the information, but you can get ahead of them by, by thinking about their psychology and thinking how you can game their thinking and then kind of reverse and engineer what they're doing. So that's one thing that we learned about um, the markets that really were key to me understanding how I should view the markets. And just, uh, you know, I, I usually mention this at the end, but I don't own any publicly traded stocks. I probably have less than 1% of my overall net worth invested in publicly traded stocks. Um, and the reason I do that, and I'm not recommending that, God, God forbid, you know, <laughs> you should, you should learn, learn about the markets and most people in the world do invest in the stock market and it's, it's a good thing for retirement and for, for long-term planning to be invested in the stock markets. But I understand from my experience of Renaissance and also by seeing other companies like Renaissance blow up that the values that companies have in the stock market, sometimes they're based on the value of a company, but a lot of times they're based on some market player choosing to buy a lot of a company or, or short a lot of a, comp a lot of a company for reasons that have nothing to do with that company. Um, a lot of times companies will use kind of what we call boring stocks. So let's say, let's say you, you have like, a, let's, let's call Microsoft, for instance, a boring technology company or IBM. They're old companies, they're not so volatile, they're not gonna double in, well, they've gone up a lot lately, but they're not typically gonna double in price. They're, they, they have low volatility, but they're representative of the technology industry. So if the technology industry is gonna go up 20%, Microsoft's probably gonna go up 20%. IBM is probably going to go up 20%. And let's say you're, you have some really cool, um, volatile new technology company that you want to buy. I mean, Tesla is a bad example, but it's not really in the same industry. But let's say you have a Tesla-like company that's new to the industry, that's really a high flyer, and you want to buy it. But you don't want to take the risk that technology stocks are going to tank because you just think that you, the company you're betting on is going to go up a lot more than everybody else not necessarily go up you know, if, if, if technology goes down. So what you might do is you might buy that stock and short IBM or short Microsoft. And that way you're covering your risk that 
technology stocks, the whole industry is going to go down, but you're still going to bet on your high flying stock that's going to go up. And so a lot of times when you look at the values of, of stocks, sometimes they don't reflect the value of the company. They might reflect the fact that there's some really big hedge funds out there that are going long a bunch of volatile stocks in the industry, and they got to short somebody. So they're going to deflate the value of these boring stocks in a way which is going to affect if you own those stocks and they go down in value, you're still going to lose money if you have to sell the stock, even if, you know, there's no nothing fundamentally wrong with the company. And, you know, we learned this because there was um, this period of time in 2008 where all of a sudden, literally, almost literally every quantitative hedge fund in the world started losing money and not just like a little bit of money, like Renaissance lost 20 times more than it ever lost in its history. And it was losing money every day. And we, we were, it was such a bad run that if it went on for another week, we would have gone out of business. And a bunch of funds did go out of business. And long story short, what ended up happening was there was some big hedge fund that was like Renaissance in some ways that went out of business and they sold off their whole portfolio. And they did it in a really clumsy way that caused all of these boring companies that everyone was using to short to hedge their exposure to go up in value because this fund was buying them all back. And so there was this huge mispricing of all these different instruments that happened for a few weeks or maybe a week for two weeks that affected every quantitative hedge fund in the world that used similar models. And when it stopped, we made all of our money back, most of our money back. But there was a period of time where we were losing, we were losing like over a billion dollars a day. We were losing over a billion dollars a day. I mean, think about that. And it was all because of this phenomenon that hedge funds push prices of instruments around in ways which don't reflect their fundamentals. And if a big fund decides to dump all its stock, then it's going to have a then then it, the, the market's going to have a problem. Um, so that's that's the main reason why I don't feel comfortable investing in stocks because I'm not looking. You know, if I was looking to be a long term investor, it doesn't really matter when you get in. You hold stocks for 20 years, and then they're, they're going to move where they're going to move. Uh, but I don't like to be an active trader in stocks because I feel like their values are manipulated. So what I'm doing today is I'm doing something um, which leads into publicly traded stocks, which is I invest in early stage companies. Um, so I, it's called venture capital investing. A variant of it's called private equity investing. Basically, I invest in companies before they're big enough to become traded in stock markets. I effectively loan money to companies in exchange for stock eventually, either I get stock immediately or I get stock eventually, but basically I'm betting that the companies I'm investing in combined with my background and my partner's background and the help we can provide them will eventually lead to them being successful, either being bought up by a bigger company or going public and becoming a publicly traded stock someday. And I hope that in a few years, five years, six years, the investments I make today will be worth 10 times, maybe even hundred times what I invest in them now. And so um, my goal is to invest in companies doing things that I understand deeply. So we invest in companies that do computer science, that do machine learning, artificial intelligence, statistical modeling. And I help the founders in, you know, improve their companies. A lot of times they don't need my help initially because they're good, good at what they do, but eventually down the road, uh, hopefully, they'll, they'll need my, hopefully they'll need my help and I'll be useful. Um, and the hope is that down the road, they'll eventually go public and I'm going to sell their stock because I don't like to hold own publicly traded stocks. Um, but but I'll, I'll be happy to have made, made, help them be successful and uh, make money in the process. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. And really, that's really all I, I wanted to tell you guys. Um, happy to field whatever questions you have about any aspect of my experience. Also, do run restaurants, not as a business, community service. I'm, a, I'm an Orthodox Jew and I uh, like to provide kosher food for my community. So really bad time to be a restaurateur. Um, happy to talk about, well, not so happy to talk about that, but willing to talk about that. Um, and also I invest a lot in um, education. Um, I give a lot of money away to um, education, particularly in trying to improve the quality of education and trying to bring technology and different modalities or different ways of teaching. In fact, way, the kinds of things I work on are perfect for the times today because a lot of the distance learning that I've been involved with is what's being deployed now in schools in the, in the coronavirus era. So again, happy to talk about any of those topics.
Uh, Dr. Bateman, thank you so much for that intro. Um, that was just awesome. Going into some really difficult concepts and making them sound super easy and, and clear to all the viewers. Um, and a lot of questions are coming in, so I'm just going to go ahead and start asking. Great. Um, I think, first of all, rolling back to the beginning of your story, um, the humbling story of when your mom said, kind of, you're on your own. Um, I provided you with as much wisdom as I can. Um, and then you, you talked about, you know, how mentors helped you um, after that. Can you speak to some of the students, um, you know, how you found mentors along your career? Um, what's the hallmark of a good mentor and, and how they impacted you? Sure. Yeah. And that's really, you know, it's really funny because I didn't think to look for mentors. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing going to college. And um, but one thing that I always tried to do was put my best foot forward. And I tried to be authentic. It sometimes it got me burned because I'm I speak my mind and uh kind of have famously gotten myself in trouble by being a little too outspoken. Um, but um, if you're authentic and you're well-meaning, mentors will find you. And that's what I found myself, that I was earnest about wanting to learn. Um, I found things that I was good at and I, I pursued them. And the truth is that my most impactful, important mentor, um, uh, Professor Max Mintz, at, uh, he's still at Penn now. In fact, he is my son's academic advisor who's currently studying at Penn. Um, so it's really uh, gratifying for me to have that relationship with him. But he saw me in his one of his classes and recognized that I was someone worth spending time with. And he pulled me aside and invited me to get involved with work he was doing and kind of like held my hand through, through college and guided me to introduce me to the right people. Um, but it wasn't, you know, I know there are a lot of people who, you know, tell stories about them being aggressive and pursuing professors. And I certainly had, you know, established relationships with professors who I thought were interesting and talked to them after class and tried to, um, you know, get involved with what they were doing. But I think the important thing is to be someone who is worthy of mentorship. And if you put yourself out there as someone who is open to criticism and open to education and is earnest and, and just shows, shows yourself, show yourself to be someone who's worth a mentor spending their time with then mentors will find you and, and actually the right kinds of mentors will find you. Um, so that, that's really my, my experience th really throughout my career was just kind of stumbling into finding people who saw that I could be valuable to them if they would just help me get a little better about what they knew about and uh, that managed to get me to where I am today. Thanks, David. That's great advice. Um, I guess the next question um, that's coming in along these lines is, um, you know, you're someone who's been on the cutting edge of technology, like you mentioned, since the beginning of the Wild West of computer science, now with differential ventures. What are some of the uh, technologies you're most excited about um, that you think are gonna impact us in the next decade? Yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, it's funny, because I invest in, in data science companies that do AI and machine learning, and I am the biggest skeptic about the what the ceiling is about machine learning and AI. I, I, computers don't think. Computers don't understand. They mimic human understanding. They mimic learning, um, but ultimately they're 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 silicon. They're 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 computers, and they and they they do what they're programmed to do. And so I think that um, the the technologies I like to invest in are the ones that are taking solvable problems, problems that are solvable by AI, and building good engineer, well-engineered versions of software that does that. Um, an example is Renaissance Technologies. We were not trying to predict the future of where a stock was gonna go. We were just trying to you know, use math, math to, to get a small edge on the rest of the world, really kind of modeling human psychology more than anything else, you know, hedging out the risks that we couldn't model and doing what we could, and we made a lot of money that way. So. I think that the technologies that I'm most interested in are the ones that understand the limits of machine learning and AI and try to solve a problem that is solvable. An example is this uh, company we invested in called Nokri. It's actually a great story because it's these two founders, as uh, Canadian founders who were having trouble getting jobs because they had um, very um, Muslim sounding names. And one of them changed his name to like, you know, Joe Smith effectively and got a job in three weeks. Um, and was really, you know, kind of moved by the experience. And so once he, you know, it was kind of not, not done with, but he was kind of satisfied with the career that he done, he had, he worked with this other founding partner of his and decided to build a 
machine learning model for human resources problems that was designed to be unbiased. And basically they, they wrote software that watches interviews, the video and audio and transcripts um, of, of interviews along with resumes and with the, the textual answers to questions that candidates do. And it, it has built a predictive models designed to be unbiased. So they're designed not to be you know, ethnically biased or religiously biased or, or gender biased. Um, they do this, they have a way of, of trying to achieve this. And they basically do the job that a frontline human resources interviewer would do of analyzing that material and spitting out an evaluation of whether they should do a second interview with that candidate. So it basically it amounts to like rating a candidate on by 10 numbers. So basically they build a mathematical model to predict 10 numbers from data. That's a solvable problem. They're not trying to pretend that they can figure out the emotions or figure out the, the intellectual capability of the candidate. All they're doing is trying to mimic a human being and they built computer systems that can rank people with these 10, 10 different measures as well as people can. And so basically they can pro help a company process 10 times, 20 times more first, uh, uh, first interviews than uh, the normal human resources could do, which, which just makes hiring more, more effective. It makes it easy for people to find jobs and the, that it does it in an unbiased way is really great. So that's the kind of technology that I like because it's, it's using AI in a way which I believe that AI can predict 10 numbers as well as people can. That's the kind of thing that we're doing. The other thing that we do a lot of is we invest in what I call the plumbing of data science. So we invest in technology companies that provide the tools that people use in data science. And the reason we like to do this is because we know that data science is gonna be invest, people are investing billions and billions of dollars in all different facets of data science. We don't know which AI companies are gonna win. We don't know who has the best AI. I know a lot about AI and I couldn't, I couldn't spend four hours with a, with a, with a founder and tell you whether their, their AI, AI was gonna be really valuable in five years, that's crazy. But I can evaluate whether a tool is gonna to be really useful for those engineers to do their work. And if I can invest in companies that are gonna to sell tools to all those data scientists, I don't care who goes out of business and who succeeds as long as they're using my tools. So we, we invest in a lot of those kind of companies as well. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Megaman. Um, and, and building off that, um, you know, what's your pitch to students who are about to be entering college and are thinking about you know, different educational paths to go down um, why, why AI, why computer science, you know, why did you get that passion? Right. Don't go into computer science. Don't go into AI. It's, it's you know, when, when, again, when, when I was a kid, my, my uncle actually offered to pay for all of my college and my medical school if I become a doctor, because back in the seventies, being a doctor was the end all. If you could become a great surgeon, your career was made. You'd be the richest guy in the block. Obviously that's not true today. That's not the greatest profession to be in, to be a, probably be a professional basketball player. Um, but, but that's my point is that I loved computer science. I didn't know computer science was gonna be a great thing. I loved math, computer science. I got really good at it because I cared about it so much that I spent my waking hours. I mean, I lived in my office. I had a sleeping bag in my office. Um, I once spent a, a winter break in, in, in grad school at IBM and, and they turned the power off. They turned the, the heat off because everyone was furloughed for the, for the break. And I, I didn't have an apartment because I was planning on sleeping in my office. So I used the computer systems to keep me warm. I would run, run a lot of algorithms on the computers near me so that they would generate a lot of heat so I can keep warm at night. Uh, didn't affect my ability to, give, 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 to have children. So I was really happy about that. But um, uh, maybe TMI. But um, it was basically I love what I did. And it happened to be that what I love to do turned out to be a great profession. And so what I tell people at your stage all the time is, don't look at what was or is the greatest thing. The job market in five years and 10 years, who knows what it's gonna be. But what you should do is figure out what you're passionate about, what you're willing to, to spend nights and weekends sleeping in your office doing and become really good or great at that thing. Even if it's poetry, even if it's something that you think is not gonna be something that's gonna be in demand and make you a lot of money, if you can become really good at something, someone will notice you and find use for what you can do. Um, so uh, I just encourage you to like not be chasing the, the shiny object of today, but you know, and uh, you should get the basic education. I mean, math, physics, chemistry, sciences, 
literature. There are core, core things you should learn because they're useful in almost anything that you can do. Um, math is really key. Writing skills are really key. But beyond that, you should really figure out what you're passionate about, what you're willing to spend 80, 90, 100 hours a week doing, and, and be successful at that. Thank you, Dr. Mann. That's a great wrap up um, from everything you spoke about um, and just, you know, in choosing a field in general and, and how, how you, you chose um, your profession and, and we're successful in it, honestly. Um, one interesting question came in, which I want to ask you. It's about the book behind you. Um, maybe that's the benefit of now that we're Zooming that we could talk about those things. Why is Tanya on your desk? Um, somebody mentioned it's the intersection of faith and um, and investing in logic. Um, but why is that on your desk? Can you tell us about the book? So, actually, funny, I put that up a few weeks ago because someone told me they could see there was some weird science fiction book on my desk and mm -hmm. they started talking about it. So I figured I should have something more meaningful behind me. Um, you know, so it's actually, it's actually an interesting, interesting question. So um, I, as I said, I, my focus when I was growing up and through my career was about education and achievement. Um, and at one point in my life, I got into a pinnacle, um, kind of got to the top of a mountain when it came to those things. I learned an enormous amount about my field. I'd reached a level of financial success I never dreamed of. I was second in command of a, of a, of a company where my bosses were the co-CEOs of a company that was incredibly lucrative. And I had this great career ahead of me and I found I was unhappy. Um, and I, I would say I was miserable. And um, I realized that, I didn't realize at the time what the issue was, but I was kind of in a, in a, a soul searching mode and eventually I found, you know, God and religion um, and not in some kind of like, you know, uh, proselytizing where I'm not trying to convince everyone to become religious, um, but that I realized that I was missing the point of life. And having spent all my time learning math and computer science and not learning anything about community and friends and not learning about um, the meaning of life, um, I was missing out on something. And so um, I, and I have the luxury now because I made a lot of money and I, I run my own business. So it's not like everyone has the freedom to do this, but I spend a few hours a week studying Torah and studying some of the, the teachings of the great rabbis. And the Tanya is uh, uh, the teachings of the, the Alter Rebbe, who's a famous, uh, very, very um, brilliant uh, uh, Torah scholar who introduced a, a certain kind of mysticism to the general population, general Jewish population. Um, I study it because I find that it helps me connect to things I can't possibly understand. And I think the humility that you get from acknowledging that there are things about the, the universe that human beings can't understand the same way that an ant can't fathom an airplane. Um, you know, that there are things, you know, that, that by immersing myself in, in topics where it's beyond me, I know it's beyond me. I'll learn what I can about it and I'll, I'll digest what I can about it, but I have to acknowledge at some level my brain will not be able to figure it out from first principles. I find that kind of learning to be really valuable for me and kind of an antidote to kind of the way that Americans view, view the world and view, uh, view the scientific nature of things. Well, that was a better wrap up than I could have possibly imagined. Um, Dr. Mayron, we're out of time, but thank you so much for touching on such difficult topics and again, making them clear. And um, now, you know, from computer science to finance and to the meaning of life and your, your own personal journey with that. We really appreciate your time um, and your energy here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the students. I wish I could see you guys, um, but maybe another time. And I wish you guys all good health and, uh, and you know, success and achievement in whatever areas you want to accomplish. I think what you're doing is great by being a part of this program. And I hope that you get a lot of value out of it and uh, you know, find value in the things that you do in life. Thank you, Dr. Merriman. Okay, thank you.